In today's video, I am going to go over an example about how a mass spectrometer works and how we can use the mass spectrometer to determine the atomic masses for different isotopes of elements. Before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, Step by Step Science, get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. When I look at my YouTube analytics, I see that many people, most people watching my videos have not subscribed. Please subscribe, click the notifications bell, give it a thumbs up, leave us a comment, and don't forget to share this video. And in addition to that, I have made a bunch of other teaching learning materials which you can find at my Teachers Pay Teacher website, whether you're looking for example problems, practice problems with solutions, notes, puzzles, activities you can do with PGT, interactive simulations. It's all there. The link is in the description below. And I made another video last week about an explanation about how mass spectrometer works. But this one, we're going to go through an example problem. And this is what we have here. We have our ion source, we have our velocity selector, and we have our mass spectrometer or our detector. And we're going to go through each step in an introduction, and then we'll be calculating the velocity and calculating the mass with the detector. Okay, so let's say we have our ion source, and let's say that that is going to be, for example, like chlorine, like chlorine gas. And we are going to pass a current through that, or we're going to heat it up, and we're going to ionize that, driving off one electron. So we have chlorine as a positive ion, and we're going to write that as Cl+, plus, and the charge on that, when we drive off one electron, is going to be the charge, it's going to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. That is the charge on an electron. And when we drive that off and remove one electron, then the chlorine ions will have a positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 charge. And then those are going to pass out of our ion source and be accelerated out of there into our velocity selector. And in our velocity selector, we have a magnetic field and an electric field at right angles to each other. The magnetic field has a magnetic field strength of 50 milliteslas. And we're not going to give you the electric field strength, but we're going to tell you that the voltage across the plates of that capa capacitor, across those parallel plates, is 140 volts. And the distance between those plates is 7 centimeters. So we can then calculate, which we'll do in just a moment, the velocity of the ions that pass directly through there and into our detector. And then we have a second magnetic field. We only have a magnetic field over here, no electric field. And that magnetic field strength, B2, is 0 0.4 Teslas. And because we know the charge, and because we know they're all going to have the same velocity, and because we know the magnetic field strength here, then those ions that pass out of that chlorine gas, out of our sample over here, are going to have different masses, because there's two isotopes of chlorine, and they're going to separate each other. They're going to separate out based on their mass. And some will hit the detector right here, which we'll call P1, and some will hit the detector right there, which we'll call P2. And the distance for P1 is 7.2 centimeters, and the distance for D or for P2 is 7.6 centimeters. And that distance is here, from here to here. That's kind of the, uh, the, the, the diameter of that circle. This is a circular path, and the distance across there is 7.2, and the distance from here to here is 7.6 centimeters. And we want to be able to figure out the mass, specifically the mass number. We'll figure out the mass first, and then we'll get the mass number. So then we can see what are the two isotopes of chlorine. There are two naturally occurring isotopes. All right. So what we have here is we have our velocity selector. We're going to start with our velocity selector. And you, when, when the first thing we're going to try and figure out is how fast are the ions going that make it through the velocity selector. So those ions are going to come from our accelerator from our ion source. And they're going to come straight through. The ones that come straight through are the ones that are going to pass through the velocity selector. Not all of them are going to come straight through. Some that don't have the correct velocity will either hit up here or be deflected down this way. We'll talk about that in a moment. But some of them will pass through, and we can calculate the velocity of those that pass through because when they pass through and they pass straight through our positive ions, they're going to feel a force from the electric field, and they're going to feel a force from the magnetic field. The force from the electric field comes from, that's right, you guessed it, the electric field, which goes from the positive plate to the negative plate, and that is going to that would cause that positively charged ion to be deflected away from the positive plate towards the negative plate, and that means that the electric force, the force from the electric field, would point up in that direction. 
Now, we want the ones that are going to pass straight through. So for them to pass through, there needs to be a corresponding force from the magnetic field that is equal in magnitude to the electric force, but opposite in direction. So that's the basic principle of how that's going to work. Now, we can calculate the velocity because we know that the electric field force is going to be pointing up, and we can calculate that as Q times E. That's how we calculate the electric force. We can also calculate the force from the magnetic field as QVB, the charge, times the velocity times the magnetic field strength. This is the charge times the electric field strength. Now, let's just go back here. I wanted just to point out the direction of the magnetic field. The electric field points up. The magnetic field, if you use your right hand, because it's a positively charged particle, I like to point my thumb in the direction of the particles. I point my palm facing down, and my fingers are the magnetic field, and they come out of the page. So this is just designating that the magnetic field, the direction of the magnetic field, is out of the page, and it's at a right angle to that electric field. Okay, now we know these two forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, and this formula for the magnetic force, for the Lorentz force, has the velocity in it. So we're going to set these two equations equal to each other because we know those forces are equal. And then we're going to solve for the velocity. Now we have charge on both sides, so we can cancel the charge. That's the charge 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So we can cancel those, and then we can solve for the velocity. So then we're going to divide both sides by the magnetic field strength and the velocity of those particles that come straight through that velocity selector because the electric force and the magnetic force are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction is simply calculated as the electric field strength divided by the magnetic field strength. Now we're given the magnetic field strength 50 milliteslas. We're not given the electric field strength, but you should remember that we can calculate the electric field strength using this equation, which says that the voltage across the plates, the potential difference across the plates, is equal to the electric field strength divided by, time, excuse me, times the distance between the plates. We are going to solve for the electric field strength, and we get that it's the potential difference divided by the distance. We're given the potential difference. We're given the distance. Remember that you have to calculate or convert the distance into meters, and you end up with the electric field strength is 2,000 volts per meter. Now on the next slide, we know now the electric field strength. We were given the magnetic field strength. We can plug those into our equation, 2,000 volts per meter. Once again, remember, this has to be in Teslas. This says milliteslas, which is 50 times 10 to the minus 3. And you get that those charged particles, those chlorine ions, which have a positive charge, are going to be traveling. And the ones that make it through, they must be traveling this speed, 40,000 meters per second, which we can write as 4.0 times 10 to the fourth meters per second. Now, we did say earlier that some that are traveling at a different speed not 40,000. Some will come up here and be deflected uh, uh, less from the magnetic force, and some will have a greater magnetic force because, let's just review this. You remember we said the, char the, the force from the electric field is QE. The force from the magnetic field is QVB. This force has the velocity in it. So if they're going faster than 4.0 times 10 to 4 meters, then this force is going to be greater, and those charged particles will be deflected down here. Well, some land down here somewhere. If they have a velocity less than 40,000 meters per second, then the force from the magnetic field will be less, and the um, uh, force from the electric field will be more than the force from the magnetic field, and those particles will be deflected up and strike uh, this barrier right here somewhere along this upper part. Okay, so only those that are going this fast will have met the conditions that the electric force and the magnetic force are equal to each other, and they will fly straight through just like that. So that's the velocity. Now we have our detector, or what some people might actually call the actual uh, uh, mass spectrometer, that's going to divide out and break out our particles based on their mass. Because when they come into this detector, they're all going to have the same charge, because they're all going to have one electron driven off, so that's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. They're all going to be traveling through the same magnetic field, and they're all going to be traveling with the same velocity. The only thing that's going to be different about them, that's going to differentiate them, is their mass. And those that are more massive are going to have 
a greater distance and land here at P2, and those that are less massive will land here. Okay? Now, we can calculate that mass because we know that those particles are going to be subjected to the centripetal force, and also we could calculate the force, strength of the force, with the um, with the Lorentz force. So this is the centripetal force. The centripetal force, this is Newton's second law, basically, F equals ma. The acceleration of an object that's traveling on a curved path is v squared over r. So I take the acceleration out and I substitute v squared over r. So this is the centripetal force. That force points directly to the center of that circle. Okay, this is a circular path. That force points to the center of the circle. And we can also use the Lorentz force to calculate that force. And we would see that we would get the same value for the force if we use QVB. So those two are going to be equal to each other, so we can set them equal to each other. And we want to solve for the mass. All right, you can see here that we have velocity squared and velocity, so one of these velocities is going to cancel with this one. So we get mv divided by r equals q times b. We want to solve for the mass, and when we solve that equation for the mass, we simply get that the mass of those particles is the charge times the magnetic field strength, this magnetic field, times the radius, not the distance, we'll talk about that, but the radius, okay, divided by the velocity. And you can see all of these things are known, or that we measured, when the particles come into the magnetic field, and then we can calculate the mass. So let's just do that. And we're going to do that for number one, and also for number two. The charge, we said it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. They come into this magnetic field, which is 0.4 teslas. We know how fast they're going, 4.0 times 10 to the fourth. And the distance, the radius, is 0.036 meters. This is 7.2 centimeters. That's the distance all the way across. Well, this is not the distance. This is the radius of this circular path, which is half of this, and then converted into meters. Half would be 3.6 centimeters. Divide by 100, and you get 0.036 meters. So that tells us that the total mass of those particles is 5.76 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. We can do the same thing for number two. You'll notice that all these values are the same because these values are the same. The only difference is the mass or the distance, so to speak. This is 7.6. Half of that is 3.8 centimeters divided by 100, and you get 0.038 meters. Everything has to be in meters in this case. And you would get that for the mass. Now, that's the total mass. Now, we want to know the mass number, the isotope number, okay, of each of those isotopes of chlorine. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those total masses, and we want to know what is the mass number. Now, you should remember... The mass number, which has the symbol A, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So we've got to figure out how many protons and how many neutrons do we need to make up this mass. Well, remember, the mass of a proton and the mass of a neutron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So we're going to divide this value, the total, by the part, so to speak, and then we'll see how many. And you will notice that this is 26 and this is 27. You might think, okay, this number is bigger, but this is minus 27 and this is minus 20. So this is a smaller number. So when we divide this number by this number, the total divided by the mass of each of the parts, okay, we get 34.7. And we're going to round that to 35, and that tells us that that is chlorine 35. Remember, chlorine is element 17. So it has 17 protons, but when we add up the protons and the neutrons together, we get the mass number, and this number right here is the mass number. That is the isotope of chlorine, one of the naturally occurring isotopes of chlorine, chlorine-35. We're going to do the same thing down here, divide by the mass of the protons and the neutrons. Okay, they both have the same mass, all right? And therefore, we can divide again. And this time we get 36.6, which we'll round to 37, and that is our other isotope of chlorine. There are two, there are two, there are two naturally occurring isotopes of chlorine, 35 and 37. And that is how you can determine the mass, okay, the mass number, the mass and the mass number of those two naturally occurring isotopes of chlorine. Okay, there you go. I hope you found that video helpful. We went through and showed you how the velocity selector works. We went through and showed you how the detector works. We went through and showed you how you calculate the mass and then how you get the mass number and the isotope 
of chlorine in that case. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do all of the following, is it four or five things? Subscribe to my channel, Step by Step Science. Get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. Please support my channel, Step by Step Science. Subscribe. Click the notifications bell so you don't miss anything. Let's see. Give me a thumbs up. Leave a nice positive comment. And don't forget to share this video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all of the support. And we'll see you in the next video.